Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, as I sit here preparing for the taping of the show, right before we go from standby to recording, I do a check of my earrings, my jewelry, my necklace, um, lipstick, my teeth. I just take a, a quick check of everything before I record because I have come on TV before missing an earring or lipstick on my teeth and I have learned to check before I tape to make sure everything is where it needs to be, right? And as I was doing that, just right before the show began, God reminded me that it's a good thing to do, to check the way we look, the way we're dressed for this world. Are, are we dressed in his righteous robe of, you know, his white robe of righteousness? Do we have the, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit? Are we dressed in that wardrobe of warfare? Are, are we presentable in this world as representatives of Christ? Are we prepared for others to see our lives? You know, uh, thousands of people watch this show. Am I as prepared to be in public as I am on TV? Do I present myself well in this world as a witness and ambassador for Christ? That was the reminder, the quickening in my spirit today that we need to be ready, ready to be God's testifiers or as we've been talking about, his forerunner for his second coming. So I have the last part of this series about John the Baptist today. And it's an exciting finale. Now, if you have missed the first few uh, studies we've done on John, you can go to the website, brushstrokeministries.com, and just hit the video archive button and all the TV shows will pop up. Or you can hit podcast and you can listen to it, download it. They're not contingent upon one another. They're individual but to see and hear the whole is powerful. So today I have the last installment of John the Forerunner study, and I've called it, Can I Get a Little Clarification? Now sometime after John baptized Jesus, he began to hear the news of Jesus and what Jesus was doing. John, after he spoke out about Herod's marriage to his sister-in-law, was arrested and put in prison sometime after the Passover, around 27 AD. It was during his period of imprisonment that he needed a little clarification about Jesus' ministry. We might even call it a doubt. So let me set the stage. Now, this is a fairly long part of scripture, but it's important that you see it, his life, in, in, in uh, this quick little snapshot of the scripture here and see the, the wholeness of some of the things we've been talking about over the last few weeks because the context is what gets me. Oh, it just gets me. So this is Luke 7, starting in verse 11. Now it happened the day after he, Jesus, went to a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. So large crowd coming in, large crowd coming out. These are all important contexts. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. 
And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. I can just hear him say, hey, what's going on? Where, where am I? What, what's the parade for? What are all these people doing here? I can just hear that, the, the young man. And he said, he presented into his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, he cured, he, Jesus, cured many of the infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many blind eyes, he gave sight. Jesus entered and said to them, go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. That the blind see, these are important contexts. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's an important one. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Or better reads, who has no doubts about me. Clearly, John needed some clarification. Now, John is in prison. Word comes that Jesus is doing all these amazing things. And John sends two of his disciples to Jesus and they say to Jesus, now remember, big crowd coming in, big crowd coming out. Lots and lots of people. And John's disciples come to him and say, Jesus, John has sent us to ask you whether or not you're the real deal. Are you the one or do we look for, or is he supposed to look for someone else? Wait, John, John the Baptist? The one who leapt in his mother's womb when he heard of the news of Mary being incarnate with Jesus himself. John, the one who said, behold, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. John, the one who has been proclaiming Jesus as the forerunner, who said, I am the Elijah, who come in the spirit of Elijah to proclaim that Jesus is coming, that the Messiah is here. John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit, who says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That John? Yeah, that John. Sitting in a jail cell going, uh, is, is he the one? Uh, are you sure? I, I just need to know. Are, are you the one, or do I look for another so here's the last part of the lesson I want to learn. I want us to learn about John the Baptist. <sighs> doubts are normal. Uh, yeah, doubts are normal. Oh, I'd like to be able to say that we are all just full of faith and we don't have a doubt. We don't have any lingering wonders of if, if, if he's here, if he's going to answer, if his will, if he's going to do what he says he's going to do, if his promises are yes and amen. I wish we could all say, boy, I got that hammered out. Woo, I got it going on. But none of us really do. None of us really do. Oh, we are full of faith. But every moment, every once in a while, a moment may creep in. Just a moment may creep in. And... What do we learn from this in John the Baptist? First of all, let me just deal with how Jesus answered John. He did not say to his disciples, go tell him, yes, I'm the one. Because anyone could declare, uh, I'm the one. Yeah, I'm the one. Just go tell him, yes, I I'm, I'm the real deal. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus did not answer him just by saying, yes, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I'm the one that he talked about. 
He didn't do it at all. In fact, he did something so special. Now, before I get there, let me finish the story. This is Luke 7 again, starting in verse 24. And we left off in 23. Here's 24. Now, after John's disciples left, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. Remember, big crowd coming in, big crowd coming out. What kind of man did you go see in the wilderness? Was he a weak reed, swayed by breath of wind? No. Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No. People who wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury are found in palaces, not in the wilderness. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes. And he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Yet even the person in the kingdom of God is great, least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. When they heard this, all the people, even the tax collectors, agreed that God's way was right, for they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in religious law rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. What was Jesus' reaction to John's doubt, condemnation? What were you thinking? I can't believe you're doubting me. What in the world are you asking me that question about? Why would you, why would you question me at all? You know better than that. No. That was not the answer Jesus gave. Jesus, remember, John's disciples have come to him and said, John wants to know if you're the one. Questioning whether you are the one. Wondering, uh, has it all been in vain? Has my preaching been in vain? Are, are you really the one? And Jesus' answer was wondrous. He looked at the people after his disciples, John's disciples left and said, folks, he is the greatest prophet who's ever lived. There is no one on the earth greater than John. What? That was Jesus' response? Yes, that was Jesus' wondrous response. You see, when we have doubt, Jesus does not respond in a finger pointing or a wagging of the finger saying, what in the world are you thinking doubting me? He says, wow, you're wonderful. You are a child of, of the king. You are a child of the most high God. You are great and wonderful. Yeah, you might have a moment, but uh, like he told the, all the crowds, John was amazing. John was the greatest man who had walked the face of the earth. And then he goes on to say that even those who are least in the kingdom are better than John. Why? Well, remember, John only had the gospel of repentance. We have the gospel of grace. We have the full good news. We have the rest of the story. John never saw Jesus crucified, resurrected, and ascended into, the, into heaven, seated next to the Father. John never saw any of that. All John saw was Jesus coming to be baptized by him and then hearing things about him. See, that's important. I tracked John and Jesus and never once does it say that John actually saw any miracle Jesus performed. Not once. He heard, but he never saw a miracle performed by Jesus. Now, Jesus' disciples saw many miracles, but John the Baptist did not see any of them. Jesus was here. Where was John? In the wilderness proclaiming Jesus was the one. And then John got soon arrested and spent what little time he had left in jail and then was beheaded and martyred. So, number one, Jesus answers doubt with love, not with condemnation. Jesus answers doubt with a, a sweet answer, right? 
I, I love his answer. He never comes against John. He never condemns him. He never accuses him of doubt. He just says, hey, who'd you go to see? You went to see a, a, a rugged man in the wilderness, and he was a good man. He still is a good man. Okay, now, not only did John, Jesus not condemn John, but he answered him. Now, Jesus, knowing all, all, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows how to answer our fears and our doubts. He knows how to answer our prayers. He knows the perfect answer. So he chose the answer that would be most perfect for John to hear. Think about that. Jesus chose to answer John in a way that Jesus knew would appease John, would please John, would suffice for John, and would give John a great peace for the end of his life. Jesus knew how to answer. And what did Jesus answer? He said to John's disciples, go tell John what you see me doing. That I'm healing up, I'm binding up the brokenhearted, I'm healing people, I'm raising from the dead, I'm preaching the gospel to the poor. Why would Jesus answer that way? I believe God spoke to my heart. Now John's call on his life came out of the book of Isaiah and Malachi, but mostly out of Isaiah. So we know that John was acquainted with Isaiah and his writings. And so do you not think that John, full of the Holy Spirit, would recognize what Jesus, what, what his disciples came back and told him Jesus was doing? Let me show you what I mean. This is Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. This is so special. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Now, John, uh, Jesus quotes this in the Gospels. He quotes this exactly, but I'm showing you out of Isaiah, what Jesus later spoke over himself. But here's what it says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to, ready? Preach good tidings to the poor. Isn't that what he told his disciples to go tell John? Go tell John I'm preaching gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to those who've been bound and captive, and the opening of prison doors to those who have been, been um, bound again, who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Jesus was telling John, John, this is the perfect answer for you. What's the answer? Isaiah. Isaiah. I'm doing exactly what Isaiah prophesied the Messiah was supposed to do. Not just claiming it, but doing it. In other words, Jesus answered John with the word. Yes, Jesus answered John with the word. What does that say for us? That Jesus will answer us out of his word. Oh God, I'm lonely. Well, I'll never leave you, forsake you. God, I'm in pain. My healing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to heal you. I set my word to heal your disease. God, I, I, I'm in a financial situation. I'm your provider. I, I will give you out of my want, uh, out of my plenty. I will give you out of the riches of my grace. God, I'm a sinner. I, I can save you by grace. Everything that we need is in his word. Everything, every answer, Jesus will answer us out of his word. Now, sometimes the word becomes flesh and it manifests itself in the flesh, but every answer we need is found in the word. John didn't need anything but a word from the word. <laughs> John 1 says, Jesus was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word came and dwelt among us. That's us. That's him. And John, all John needed was, oh, wow, he is the one because he's doing exactly what the word said he was going to do. Do you know how much peace that gives me, knowing that everything in God's word that he said he would do he will do. 
He will accomplish everything that he has said in his written word. Everything. Nothing, God says, that his word will not return void. It will accomplish what it set out to do. And that's how Jesus answered his cousin, John the Baptist. Think John, the disciples went to John and say, John, I just got to tell you, Jesus is doing this, 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 this. And I know the Holy Spirit, I know the Holy Spirit brought back to John Isaiah 61. Especially the part about preaching the good news to the poor. That has to ring. And John must have said, oh, thank you. He is the one. He is the one. So let me finish the story. Let me finish the story for John. So John now, being in prison, not condemned by his questioning, needing just clarification because of doubts rising up. Listen, uh, it, it, it's normal. It is normal to have a little doubt. Now, we can't let that doubt run us. We can't let that doubt rule us. We can't let that doubt overshadow what we know about God. And John allowed the news of Jesus to speak to him. And I know what happened next. Now, I'm just going to, I can't prove it by scripture, but I can prove it by God. Amen? So hear me. John, sitting in a prison cell, knowing that he had a death sentence upon him, sent messengers to Jesus saying, are you the one? And Jesus sent his messengers back with the answer from the word, from Isaiah himself saying, I have come to preach the good news, the good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison doors. John understood. And I guarantee you that John sat in that prison cell thinking, oh, my life, my life's call was not in vain. My purpose was a good one. My job to proclaim Jesus was not in vain. I can see John getting that word from his disciples because we never hear anything else of John about his doubts or his wanderings or his needing some type of clarification. We don't hear anything. Next thing we know, John is beheaded. And I have to believe that Jesus knowing the way to answer John, the way that he knew to answer you and me is, was perfect. And that John received that news and went, oh, yes. I have run the race. I have run it well. I have finished the course. I have fought the good fight of my faith. And into, my, into the hands of God, I go. I go knowing that my life was not in vain. My being a forerunner was not in vain. My proclaiming Christ was worth it all. Because he is who he said he is. Now, if we believe Jesus is who he said he is, and that he is going to come again as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, if he is coming again, then our lives as a forerunner will never be in vain. We need to fight the good fight and run the race well. We need to proclaim that Jesus is about to return. We need to exemplify the life of John and be that voice crying out in this vast wilderness of this world, proclaiming that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, he's coming to judge the world this time. And we don't want anyone to have to live through that judgment. Jesus came, he say, came to save the world, to seek those who are lost, who want to be found. Oh, saints, there is John's life before us 
an inspiration for us. The last great prophet of the Old Covenant, a forerunner for the new. What an impact he had on the world around him. The impact we could have could be so significant if we pursued even just a little of what John demonstrated as the forerunner to Christ's first coming. Our proclaiming, our witnessing, our testifying will never ever be in vain. Oh, it might cost us something, it cost John his life, because John came against sin. Understand that that's what cost him his life, was he came against the leadership of the time and the sin that they were perpetrating and the stances they took contrary to God's word. And John came against that sin. And when we come against that sin and call for repentance in this world and proclaim Christ's coming, it will never be in vain. We will run the race well. We will fight the good fight of faith. And we will gather with our Savior when he comes for us and raptures the church out. Oh, folks, if you do not know this Jesus, I'm going to act as the forerunner and tell you, you need Jesus. And if you need to find Jesus, will you let us help you? We will lead you directly to the Savior, to the King who loves you with a love unspeakable and immeasurable. He loves you and he is wanting a relationship with you. Folks, it's a beautiful picture that he's painting your life with his one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.